shalom and welcome to the Ghetto Fighters House International Online Series Talking Memory. My name is Medin Shahar and I work at the Ghetto Fighters House as a guide and an educator. I want to welcome our global audience from all over the world, as you can see in the chat, literally from all over the world, including friends and colleagues from Holocaust museums and institutions as well as academics and students from universities, historians, and our many friends who attend our Talking Memory series. A special welcome to the survivors and their families that are with us today, including those who are connected to today's program on the Holocaust in Lithuania, the second in a two-part series. We want to thank everyone for their support and interest in our programs. And today's program is in partnership with the Rabin Chair Forum at the George Washington University. We are honored to host Sylvia Foti, and to be part of the global book launch of her book, The Nazi's Granddaughter, How I Discovered That My Grandfather was a, was a War Criminal. Our second guest today is Grant Goshen, the grandson of Holocaust survivors from Lithuania, who will share his personal journey taking legal action against the government of Lithuania to pursue truth and justice in the name of the 200,000 Jews killed in the Holocaust in Lithuania. Our two speakers today both have roots in Lithuania, but their family histories and heritage are very different. In this second in our two-part series on the Holocaust in Lithuania, we want to continue the discussion that we started last month with Ephraim Zorov and Arthur Chaldi. Jews have lived in Lithuania since the 14th century, but during the Holocaust, over 95% of Lithuania's pre-war Jewish population, as many as 220,000 individuals or more, were brutally slaughtered. With less, less than 1,000 Germans stationed in Lithuania and with 90% of the Jewish community murdered by shooting, it is clear that this labor-intensive murder by bullets was carried out by local Lithuanians. With the independence of Lithuania from Soviet rule in the 1990s came the hope that the country would face its past and create a national narrative that involves taking responsibility for its role in the Holocaust in Lithuania. Instead, the country has never punished a single Holocaust perpetrator. The position put forth by the government is that unless someone was tried and convicted during their lifetime, they must be considered completely innocent. Furthermore, Lithuania is the only country in the world that has gone to court to defend the good name of a Holocaust perpetrator. This is where we continue the story with Sylvia and Grant, who we will soon discover have courageously joined together in the fight to get the Lithuanian government to acknowledge that those who had been honored as heroes had also been responsible for the murder of thousands of Jews. And now I would like to introduce our guests. Sylvia Foti. She holds a master's, degree, master's degrees in journalism, education, and creative nonfiction, has been a journalist for 20 years, has published two mystery novels, and has been a high school English teacher since 2007. She published a memoir piece about the traumas her father experienced under the communist in Lithuania in the literary magazine Dappled Things and was awarded second place in its 2015 Jacques Maritain Prize for Nonfiction. She speaks English, Lithuanian, and Spanish fluently. Sylvia grew up speaking Lithuanian exclusively in her home in Chicago, attended Lithuanian Saturday School for 10 years, and was a member of several Lithuanian organizations, including Scouts, a dancing group, a volleyball club. Most of her summers were spent at Lithuanian camps in Michigan and Vermont, where she learned more about her heritage. As a teenager, she worked at a hospital funded, founded by Lithuanian nuns at a printing company that published Lithuanian publications and for Lithuanus, a Lithuanian American quarterly. At home, she learned countless stories about her grandfather, Inus Norieka, from her mother and grandmother, and was raised to adore him, as well as the homeland. Her latest book, The Nazi's Granddaughter, How I Discovered My Grandfather Was a War Criminal, that was released on March 9th, is her first-hand account of her journey, which began as an act of family pride and ended with uncovering the secret her family and an entire nation had kept hidden for decades. For her courage, Sylvia has received numerous awards for her fight against anti-Semitism and dedicating her life to truth and justice. Her book addresses questions like, how should our families past shameful or noble, shape our identity? And why are some European countries still in denial about their role in the Holocaust? These are questions that will be in the background of, our today, of today's discussion. And now Grant Goshen. Grant is a South African Jew, 
of a Lithuanian heritage who is actively involved in Jewish affairs, focusing on historical justice. Grant is the author of Malice, Murder, and Manipulation, published in 2013. His book documents his family history of oppression in Lithuania. He is presently working on a project to expose the current Holocaust revisionism within the Lithuanian government and has taken legal action against the government of Lithuania to pursue truth and justice in the name of 200,000 Jews killed in the Holocaust in Lithuania. At least 100 members of Grant's own family were murdered at the hands of their fellow countrymen in the orders of Jonas Norieka. And finally, professionally, Grant is a certified financial planner and practices as a wealth advisor in California where he lives with his family. Um, so those are the introductions. That's the short background. And I want to go uh, straight uh, to the first question. We're going to be uh, doing an interview format today, a uh, very informal interview format. Uh, Sylvia and Grant, uh, we'll start with questions and we'll see how we uh, continue along the way. But I do want to start I guess I could say at the end with uh, with uh, with the book. And uh, for those of you who have already had the chance to read the book, um, I'm, I think I have another 50 pages I'm still reading. Uh, we see a connection between the two journeys that you both have been on. Uh, but coming from two very different family histories, uh, Sylvia being the granddaughter of a Lithuanian perpetrator, Jonas Norieka, and Grant, the grandson of his victims. Tell us how and when you connected. And I want to start with Sylvia. Hi, Medine. It's so nice to be here. Um, you know, it took me, uh, I, I started the story in the year 2000, and um, I was working on it and doing all the research. And then in 2018 uh, was when I met Grant. So for 18 years, I was on this path, uh, essentially by myself, mm -hmm. um, just kind of working, uh, not really telling much many people about it because I knew how controversial it could be. But when I finally finished writing the story, um, I had to... Uh, find an agent and then I had to you know get an agent who would find a publisher so to do that I had to build an author platform and the first thing an author has to do is put up a website so I got the website up and literally within days in March 2018 a researcher from Lithuania emails me Andrus Kulikauskas and says hello, and he introduces himself, you know, I'm a researcher for uh, a gentleman by the name of Grant Goshen, a Lithuanian American. He is launching a lawsuit against the Genocide Center about your grandfather, uh, Jonas Noreka, uh, for Holocaust distortion. And when I read this, I almost fell off my chair uh, because I was, I, it, I mean, it was pretty shocking to see this, you know, until then I thought it's, you know, just going to be about my grandfather and that's it. And then when I saw that email, I, I was stunned. And, um, and then Andrew says, uh, you should really talk to Grant. <laughs> and, and I thought, oh my gosh, I don't think I want to. <laughs> um, and I was really frightened of doing that. You know, what is this man uh, who's launching this? Like, what am I getting myself involved in? But it took me about six weeks uh, to really talk myself into it. And then after, after about six weeks, I said to myself, you know, who am I writing this book for if not for someone like Grant? So, uh, so I summoned up my courage and I wrote an email and press send. And, um, and then Grant, you want to pick it up from there? Sure. <laughs> So, so let me go back to the beginning of my journey on this uh, with, with Sylvia's grandfather. And my journey on Jonas Noreka started in about 2010. Um, three of my grandparents were from the Baltics. And my grandfather had always said to me, uh, if I'm ever able, I need to go in his place and say Kaddish. And I need to, to remember. And my entire childhood, I grew up 
with my grandfather's stories. And I was one of the very first people to go to Lithuania once it was liberated. And in 2010, I was standing, there's, there's three killing fields in my grandfather's village. And I was standing over one of them saying Kaddish. Um, and I said to the academic I was with, who actually did the murders? And the academic said to me, it was a man by the name of Jonas Noreka. So I came back to the United States and I didn't know who Jonas Noreka was. And I started researching. And in 1984, so six years before Lithuania regained independence, the Spiegel in Germany came out with an expose that showed that Noreka was uh, the perpetrator. Lithuania regained independence in 1990. And in 1997, 13 years after Noreka was exposed as, as this mass genocidal murderer, the Lithuanian government gave him the highest national honors. So they knew exactly what he'd done. And so I started researching Noreka and I found out that Noreka, well, when Sylvia looked this up, Sylvia said that the Lithuanian government cover-up of Noreka was the biggest criminal cover-up of the 20th century. But when I started researching, Noreka was only one of many. We uncovered this pervasive program within the Lithuanian government to convert murderers into national heroes and deny their crimes. So I started approaching the Lithuanian government and thinking initially, okay, you've made a mistake. It's a uh, mistakes happen. Um, to discover that it wasn't a mistake. It was deliberate. And it was on such a much bigger scale than, than one or two. Um, so I was very far along. Uh, I actually, I'd like to post a link if people would take a look at this. Uh, I'm going to post it in the chat group. Hold on a moment. Mm -hmm. This is my link of litigation and claims against the Lithuanian government just to tell the truth. And what I've proven, do you see the link, Medine? The link is there. Okay. So what I've proven is that there is total collusion between the government, the criminal authorities, the courts, the government's historical institution to perpetuate this cover-up. It isn't just one segment of government or another. It's actually a massive, if, if people will read that, it is the coursework, it is, it is the map of how a government revises Holocaust history. But so Grant, it's one. happening parallel to Sylvia's work. You do not meet until the book, until the mm -hmm. website is put up. So you're working from your end. Sylvia, you're doing your research. And in a minute, I'll ask you how the evolution of your research, but these, these are happening in two completely different places. They're not, you're not meeting each other. You're not running into the same places only when you're finished with your book, and which is incredible that this can happen so separately. And yet only in the end when the, with the book is a catalyst for this uh, connection with each other. Um, before we continue, uh, I, I do want to, to go back uh, to when Sylvia starts uh, writing the book. I want to share with our audience um, something from uh, Sylvia's book about how she felt growing up. Uh, and I started talking about this a little bit in, in when we talked about who you are, you know, growing up with, with a Lithuanian heritage. So in the book, uh, you write, I felt like a princess. Growing up as the granddaughter of a hero, and we just heard Grant talking about uh, what it is to be uh, a hero that is actually <laughs> a murderer. So try to understand Sylvia's point, you know, going back and thinking of her own 
family history, I grew up feeling like a princess, the granddaughter of a hero who had bravely resisted the communists and who had been tortured by the KGB. I basked in the warm affection and approval of everyone in Chicago's Lithuanian community at song and dance festivals, at summer camps, which I uh, mentioned first of all, and at concerts in which my mother sang, I was heir to Jonas Norieka's illustrious legacy. Jonas Norieka, the Lionhearted, growing up with this sense of family distinction, of noble heritage, felt like having a trust fund. The aura of heroism seemed to have been transferred magically to me to inform, me, to inform my very essence. So I want to go back, Sylvia, when uh, how you got to the, this place where you're writing the book uh, and what you actually knew about your grandfather because you never met him, you only heard the stories. So what was it like to grow up being a princess? What was it like growing up in this household that uh, always talked about your grandfather as uh, this hero? Um, yeah, you know, my grandmother, his wife, and my mother, his daughter, uh, really raised my brother and me, uh, very Lithuanian in Chicago. And um, they always brought up Jonas Noreka. And uh, I only heard, you know, how he died in a KGB prison fighting for Lithuanian freedom. He was 36 years old. He died a martyr for the cause. He tried to lead a huge rebellion against the communists in 1945. He was betrayed by a KGB agent, then brought to the prison, tortured, died. Um, so that was the ending of the story, which is dramatic enough. And before that, um, you know, I had heard how he was in a, in a Nazi concentration camp for two years. It's how could right? a Jew killer? Yeah. How could a Jew killer be in a Nazi concentration camp? Of course, he's a wonderful man. Um, so, and then before that, I had heard how he led uh, the first rebellion against the communists in 1941. So, and that, um, it, and, and that they won uh, against the communists. They got Lithuania back from the communists. Of course, I missed the other whole big part of the Holocaust story. I did not know that. Um, so, um, you know, I would go, I would be in Lithuanian school and uh, I remember like one history teacher who was a colleague of my grandfather in Shaole, he would say, your grandfather was such a good man. He was a hero, mm -hmm. you know, and, um, you know, I would go to like lots of Lithuanian events in Chicago and uh, all kinds of people would come up to my mom mostly and I'd kind of, you know, be at her elbow and they'd be talking about Jonas Noreka and, and everybody would be like, look, this is his granddaughter, Sylvia. Oh my gosh, you know, it was like that all the time. Um, so that's, that's how I grew up with it. And then my mom was working on this story for the past 40 years. Wow. And, uh, you know, until 2000. And because the Lithuanian community essentially had asked her to write the story about her famous father. She was an educated woman and, you know, she used to write for the Lithuanian newspaper Draugas like all the time. And so um, it was going to be in Lithuanian. She was going to write it in Lithuanian. And in 19, after 1990, when Lithuania got its independence, my mom like went every year to Lithuania, right. uh, you know, uh, to, to gather more material. So by 1997, um, she had asked my brother and me to go with her because the president of Lithuania at that time, President Algirdas Brazauskas, wanted to confer a very special award to my grandfather. Uh, and this is it. Wow. The Cross of the Vitas, which is the highest honor you could receive posthumously. Uh, for being a grand hero in Lithuania. So the president of Lithuania gave this to my mother, was standing at her side, my brother at the other side, you know, and we were just feeling wonderful about how so proud about him. Because now so, Lithuania is liberated and they're not under Soviet rule and he was against the uh, Soviet rule and the communists. So now everything is wonderful. They can open up and express, you know, their heritage. Um, I want to go to Grant. Because you also grew up in a home 
and you already started talking about uh, your grandparents, you also grew up in a home where it must have been present, right? The, uh, the experiences that your grandparents had. Can you kind of give us a sense because you're third generation as well as uh, uh, Sylvia. Well, okay, so, so, so let me actually clarify. Three of my grandparents actually left before the Shoah. Okay. Um, my grandfather, he, you know, that, that generation never spoke because they were so scarred with PTSD that they never spoke to the young generation. It, but my grandfather was different. Yeah, I was the only grandson and he used to sit me next to him and he had photographs from before the war and he would show them to me and he'd say, this was so-and-so and this was, this is my friend and this is who I served in the military with and they're all dead. And he never explained to me how they were all dead. But, you know, his whole life, he was just sitting waiting for just one person from the old country to make contact to say that we survived. And because he was in South Africa, South Africans weren't allowed to go to the Soviet Union. So he was never able to get back. So he would sit there and say, I can't go back. To, to my shtetl, I can't go back to Papile. Um, he, he called uh, Popolan, um, which is the Yiddish. He said, I need you to go back and to say Kaddish. I need you to go back and, and, and to put a stone where... So I grew up with this atmosphere that there were so few cousins and there was just this heaviness so, you know, when I went back, when I went back, I wanted to, I wanted to do for my grandfather what he wasn't able to do. I wanted to say Kaddish. I wanted to restore the, the cemeteries. And it was a long process because I started, I started, um, I made contact with, with, with the Lithuanian government in exile before they even regained independence in 1990. I think my first communication was in 1988, um, saying I wanted to re-engage and I wanted to understand and I wanted to learn. I wanted to understand my grandfather's you pain. You saw it as an opportunity as well. Lithuania is opening and now I'm gonna be liberal and I can go back. Good. And hmm. so it was, uh, I mean, it was a very long learning experience um, so by the time Sylvia actually contacted me in 2018, uh, I've become so cynical. Um, I've encountered so much adversity and hostility and dishonesty. When Sylvia contacted me, I was incredibly suspicious. And then mm -hmm. she gets me on the phone and, I, and, 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 and I'm hostile, ready for... And she says to me... I've read all of your research because I made it all public. And I'm sitting there saying, yes, 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 waiting, waiting for the, the inevitable attack. And she says to me, um, I only find one error in, in, in your research. And I said, what? <laughs> she says, you've missed about 10,000 of my grandfather's victims. And with that, all the suspicions that I had just, just dissipated. And then she said to me, would you like to read uh, my manuscript? And she emailed it to me. Now, I'd been researching Noreka by this point for eight years. I'd been researching and engaging with Lithuania. I mean, I, I've probably been 10, 11, 12 times over the years. And I sat down and I read the manuscript, which wasn't titled, which wasn't titled this at that point. And I'll tell you, I sat down and started reading and I didn't get up until I finished. I will tell you, I've read this book probably six or seven times. And when you get into the thirties chapters and it starts yeah. really, I mean, I, I cannot tell you how many liters of tears I've shed when reading this book. Um, it is magnificent. And it's the first time that somebody's truly stepped forward from the other side. The other side. 
and really laid out the facts as they are. And, and I, I need to give absolute respect to Sylvia Foti in public because she's done something remarkably brave. Um, it's a remarkable book. I have to say, just listening to the way you talk with each other, I really feel like I'm talking about two Lithuanians that have a Lithuanian heritage that just want to go back to the homeland and, 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 and see it for what it is. And I think that makes the connection even more. Uh, and, and Maydeen, to make things better, because, you know, reconciliation based on lies is not reconciliation. Dialogue based on lies won't survive. Sylvia's family and my family come from the same shtetl. Our, our, our grandparents shopped in the, in, the same, in the same markets. They went to the same wells. They went to similar playgrounds. Here we are, her family and my family were in the same shtetl 100 years ago. And here we are now. And just in the interim, her family murdered mine. So it's an eventful 100 years. A very eventful 100 years. So I want to um, kind of go, go back to the separate uh, journeys and, and get a better sense of the timeline. We, we heard 2010, 2018, 18 years, 10 years, eight years. I want to um, get a sense of the motivation, Sylvia, that uh, got you started. We started talking about this, how you started this journey, what was put upon you as the granddaughter of, and you started talking about uh, uh, your mother writing, uh, starting to write the book. And uh, actually for 40 years, you said she was working on it, right? Yeah, just collecting right? every, okay. all so these three we get a sense. But I want you to uh, tell us about the moment that you actually uh, literally inherit this, um, this writing of the history of your grandfather and, and how it evolved. And then I want to also hear from uh, Grant uh, what, what your motivation was. Of course, obviously, uh, your, your grandfather, uh, his uh, silence, but the heaviness that you felt are all part of this. But what is the, the motivation to keep you going, to go beyond your own uh, family history? So we're starting with Sylvia and your uh, journey and how it evolved and how it started and how it evolved. And then we'll uh, move on to uh, Grant to hear how his journey started and how it evolved. Well, it uh, start, you know, it was in the year 2000, but I was, I was 38 years old then. I was a full-time journalist. Um, and I was uh, almost best friends with my mom by that point. And, you know, we would go to the opera together and she was always talking about Jonas Nareka and her, you know, her father and the research she's doing and how she wants to write this book. How was she going to do it? She had gotten a PhD in literature, I believe, to kind of fortify her storytelling skills so that she could write this book. So anyway, I thought she was just going to do it. You know, she was only 60 at the year in the year 2000. And I thought you know, over the next 20 years, she was going to write it. But she had diabetes and a bad back. And uh, she was in and out of the hospital a lot, but she always got out. And so in the year 2000, she was called back in for another test. And we all thought, okay, she'll just be out again like she always does. And I went to visit her and she looked um, horrible. And she had, she had gotten an infection in the hospital. And uh, she calls me over to her bedside and says, Sylvia, you have to write the book. There was no question over what book we were talking about. And I said, no, 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 mom, you're going to do it. You're going to get out. You're going to be fine. But uh, she says, you have to. Everybody expects it. I mean, she'd been working on this for 40 years and, and it's got to get done. So she, that's how she passed it on to me. And when your mother's dying, you only have one answer to give her. So uh, I said, yes. And I came back the next day and she was already in a coma. And that was it. And uh, she died two weeks later, February 4th. And here I was with this insane deathbed promise. Five months later, 
my mother or her, my grandmother, her mother, uh, who we, I always call Mochute, which means grandmother. And uh, she had another heart attack, her third or fourth. And she was in her, her late eighties and, and now she's on her deathbed and she calls me over and says, uh, Sylvia, how's the book? And I said, don't worry, Mochute, it's fine. You know, uh, it's, I'm 38 years old. I'm young, I'm a journalist. I'm, I'm not gonna let it go the way mom did. I'll, I'll get it done. And I thought I was comforting her. And she says, don't write the book. Hmm. And I said, what? And she says, just let history lie. I'm like, what are you talking about? And she says, there's no, re there's no need to dig around in there. And I said, but I promised mom on her, you know, how can I go back on my promise to her? Like, it's a sacred promise at this point. I have to do it. And she saw my resolve and did not like my answer. And she was tired. And then, so she rolled over in bed and like faced the wall. And I said, okay, well, you know, I'll come back another day. <laughs> well, the other day I came back and she was already in a coma. And then she died within two weeks. Uh, so, uh, so they both wanted to be buried in Lithuania. And uh, so they were cremated. And um, my brother, who lives in California, and I brought their cremains to Vilnius. And then we had the funeral. And then uh, after that, we were invited to the grammar school, named after my grandfather, the Jonas Noreko Grammar School. And so we're visiting and the children are lying, you know, all lined up with flowers and singing beautiful songs. And, you know, we were uh, greeted so grandly. And we walk in and the director uh, has us walk into his office and the teachers are all standing around. And uh, he says, I heard that you're writing the book. And I said, <laughs> yes, but everybody knows about this book. And he said, you're such a good daughter for taking over this project. And I said, thank you. Of course, I had to do it. And then I said, you know, as long as I'm here, maybe I could conduct a little research. Why don't you tell me how you named the school after my grandfather? And he said, well, you know, uh, you know, Lithuania was occupied by the Soviet Union until 1990. And he says, you know, we had this horrible Russian name before at the school. We wanted to get rid of that terrible Russian name. We wanted a good patriotic Lithuanian name. And your grandfather, this magnificent hero, you know, practically a legend in Lithuania, uh, was born in this little town of Shukone. So, of course, you know, it was a natural that his name came up. And I said, okay, you know, that makes sense. And I thought that would be the end of the story. And then he pulls me to the side. And he says, but you know, I got a lot of grief over naming the school after your grandfather. And I said, grief from who? And he said, the Jews. And I said, what could the Jews possibly say about my grandfather? And he looked at me like I should have known this. And he said, he was accused of killing Jews. And I said, what? And I uh, almost fainted. I needed to sit down. Uh, it was like a punch in the gut, you know. That was the first time I had heard this in the school named after him. And he saw now that I'm visibly upset. And he says, don't worry. It's just, it's, it's just communist propaganda. It's not really true. So um, then I came back to Chicago and I started to talk to uh, my father and relatives and people my, my parents' age. And I said, have you ever heard this story that Jonas Nareka was accused of killing Jews? And they're all like, oh yeah, we heard it. I'm like, what? So every, like, like a lot of people know this. And I said, what do you mean? Why, well, how come I never heard this? Why didn't you tell me about this? And uh, they're like, well, it's not true. It's just communist propaganda. Why would we talk about it? So, um, you know, that was in October 2000. Okay. All this was like October 2000. So it did take me, you know, and I liked that story. You know, when Lithuanians don't like something, it's always communist propaganda, by the way. <laughs> 
So, uh, so I was a good Lithuanian. I said, yeah, okay, I like the story. It's communist propaganda. And um, so I, I kind of, you know, went along with it because it was convenient and much easier than facing the truth of it. So for about 10 years, almost 10 years, give or take, I was busy going through these three books out here that my mom had left. After she died, all this was in her, her which was my old bedroom, her studio, she called it. <laughs> and uh, she had been collecting all this material on it. So I brought it all over here and I was going through it. And like, you could see those white binders. Those are the KGB transcripts, 3000 pages of the KGB transcripts where he was interrogated. Say what you will about the Russians. They're very good at transcribing <laughs> their interrogations. So uh, so I had to go through all that and just, you know, and plus I was working full time doing everything else, you know, um, but looking into the Nazi occupation. Um, but then, of course, I uh, came across, you know, something that my grandfather had written. And uh, it's called mm -hmm. Pakal Galva Yetuvim, which means raise your head Lithuanian. And um, there's his name, Jonas Nareka at the top. And it's 32 pages. And I thought, okay, he wrote it in 1933, published in Kaunas. Maybe it's just like a patriotic thing, you know, raise your head with Wayne and be proud of with Wayne and all that. And I start reading it and it's, it's about um, boycotting the Jews, <laughs> boycotting everything that the Jews are doing in Lithuania. The, whatever they're selling, don't buy from the Jews. Lithuania is from Lithuanians. Oh, and if the Jews have good positions, they shouldn't have those positions. Those positions belong to Lithuanians. The Jews are the foreigners. So on and on and on and on like this. By the time I finished this, I wanted to burn it. Right. Because I could not, you know, by the time I, you know, I was, I was kind of telling myself as a journalist that I, I knew I couldn't ignore what I was calling the rumor at the time, the, the Jewish rumor. And I said, you know, I was thinking I could exonerate him. Like I was gonna like put this rumor to rest and, you know, save my grandfather's reputation, save Lithuania's reputation. I'll, sh I'll show everybody. And uh, when I saw this, I thought, wow, this is not gonna help. Right. So this was kind of a big turning point. For a turning me point, exactly, it. exactly. It's a primary source document. He wrote it. I, there's no guesswork over what he thought. Right, because actually one of the things that we see in the book, by the way, Sylvia, you're saying this is an actual document, authentic document. One of the statements against you is that you weren't a historian. So how can you come and claim an historical uh, narrative when you yourself are not actually an historian. So that's uh, something that you can find uh, in the book and also excerpts from the, his booklet as well from 1933. And I can understand that was a turning point and then your book changes at that point. What's interesting and here I wanna put in uh, grants, uh, what, what you went through, what, you, uh, uh, what your motivations were because when you buy the book and read it, everyone, you'll see that um, uh, Sylvia changes the book. Because if you wrote the book before you met Grant and you guys worked separately, the book is now a connection and an, an integration between what you write and there's always a statement at the end that has to deal with what Grant is doing. So this is our junction where you actually not only evolve as, uh, you know, uh, uh, what can I call it, the fighters for the truth, but it also, the book meshes together your two journeys. So I wanna uh, stop now with uh, Sylvia at this turning point, which and I can imagine must have been, uh, you know, from going from being a princess and feeling like I've got, you know, the life of the, the, the granddaughter of a hero to suddenly realizing that I'm now gonna change my book and what my mother had started for so many years. And now I wanna hear Grant, your motivation, my, my motivation started out completely emotionally. My, my grandparents were wounded people. Um, my gran I, I worshipped the ground my grandmother walked on. 
And, and her last words to me was, uh, I wish I knew what my name was and who my family was and where I come from. And some of the last words of my grandfather were, um, maybe you'll find out that somebody survived. And so I grew up with this pain. I grew up with this emptiness. And so I started going back and restoring cemeteries and trying to restore memory. And I encountered unbelievable adversity and dishonesty. And then I discovered that the murderer of my own family was Jonas Noreka. And it was impossible to contemplate that somebody could make a national hero out of a genocidal murderer. So I thought, okay, I just need to tell them. I just need to go to them and say, folks, you, you've made a mistake. Let's, let's fix it. And Medine, I encountered such dishonesty. Um, there was the, the inversion of facts, the denial of, of straightforward data, the, um, the, the dishonesty of their foreign diplomats to Jewish entities. Mm. And so I started following their public narrative and it's everything. There were 900 Lithuanians that, that saved Jews, but nothing about those that murdered Jews. So I go to them and I say, how can you only talk about these 900? But there were probably 20,000 Lithuanians that participated in, 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 in crimes against humanity, never mind the multiples of that that, con that participated in the plunder. And, and the, them approaching Jewish groups and giving false information. So I kept going back and back and back to the government saying, you're making a mistake. <laughs> Until finally, it was like a club on my head saying, they have no intention of telling the truth. There is no willingness to tell the truth. And that's when I began to litigate. Right. Now, I think to date, I, I think I filed 13, 14 lawsuits against the Lithuanian government. Every one of them only to tell the truth. That's the only thing I ask. And what I've been able to prove is that there is no path to truth inside Lithuania. I use the word collusion of the foreign ministry, of the, the, the history agency of the government is an official government department set to record history that has the force of law. So for example, in approaching them, they threatened me with criminal charges for submitting, I'll, I'll, I'll give you that link. They, they went so far to intimidate me to, hold on, let me get that link and give it to you and tell me if it comes across. Okay. Um, they intimidate Lithuanians that try and tell the truth. They haven't been able to intimidate me because I'm American. Mm. But when they publicly state that they want to file criminal charges against me for submitting a historical study, shows you the, the extent. So their current, their, 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 their current dishonesty to Jewish groups is we want foreign academics. But the foreign academics have already spoken. Mm -hmm. uh, Professor Diekman, Professor Shugedlis, Professor Snyder, Professor Browning, they've all spoken. So Lithuania doesn't want to hear foreign. I, I mean, I'm sure if they went to David Irving or, <laughs> right. or what's his name? Um, what's it? The Norman Finkelstein. Those would, those would be the academics they'd want to hear from. Um, but it's still the, 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 the constant motivation for me is every single time I see a tweet or a speech from a Lithuanian diplomat to a Jewish organization, 
that is so carefully worded, that is so carefully manipulated, it reinvigorates me. <laughs> and so my case right now, because there is no path to truth inside Lithuania, I've had to file a lawsuit against the government of Lithuania in the European Court of Human Rights, and that is currently pending. Um, I actually so want to, uh, do you want to say one more thing? Yes, no. Grant. I just wanted to, uh, I'm listening to what you both are saying. Uh, this turning point for Sylvia, you know, discovering this book and you being confronted with this animosity and with outright lying from a government, and yet you continue to pursue uh, the truth and justice. I want to, I, I have to ask um, how this affects you uh, in your own lives. Uh, I know, I know because I've uh, uh, talked with Sylvia and I was reading the book, there are things that you had to do in order to go forward with writing the book. You were working and you were a journalist and at some point you had to decide, okay, am I gonna, if I'm going to continue now, how am I gonna go about that? And, and Grant as well, this is not your profession. You're not a lawyer. So I wanna uh, ask you how this, these, these personal journeys that have become you know, more of a voice for a larger audience, what, how, how has that affected you? Have there been sacrifices? What have you mm -hmm. had to give Imagine up? It, you know what, it's a fabulous question. I, I, I do a lot of philanthropic work and genocide is a state of being for humans. And the 10th stage of genocide is always denial. And the Lithuanian government is engaged in denial. Now, my huge fear is my son's generation. Right. And I look at him, um, you know, he didn't grow up with my grandfather to learn about these human rights violations and, and, and these incredible crimes. If we allow for historical revisionism of this kind, A, it facilitates the next genocide. What are we doing to the next generation if we don't demand truth for the previous genocide? And then I look at him and I say, you know, Sylvia and I are two lone voices. There's a Freimzorov, there's Ruta von there's, there's there's a number of people out there but we are single voices against the entire machinery of the Lithuanian government. How is my son going to learn what the facts are when Lithuanian government officials are standing up, holding the narrative, speaking to our NGOs and, and, and spewing, spewing falsehood? This, I, I will tell you, Forget that it's, it's Sylvia's story. Forget that it's my story. This is an, a book of Orwellian proportions. How a genocidal regime rewrites history. This is actually a manual for every future genocidal regime on how, you, on, on how Lithuania has rewritten history into a false narrative, it's facilitating the next one. And, and I mean, for, for the memory of our families, for all of the victims, I think we owe them the truth. For my son's generation, I think we owe them the duty of care that we can say, we're not letting the last genocide go free. So hopefully this can be a tool to stop the next genocide. I think as human beings, as Jews, as citizens of democratic countries, I don't think we have a choice but to stand against this. Thank you, Grant. Um, actually, I, I think I can even pinpoint the question even better for Sylvia. There are a few people that have been asking the same question over and over, and it's an obvious question, of course, and I even had it in one of my questions. Uh, if we're talking about uh, sacrifices and how this has affected you, um, many people are asking, 
what happened within the Lithuanian community. Uh, I, of course, we can ask that you're uh, near Chicago where you grew up. What happened to this close-knit community when they started discovering uh, that the book was gonna come out and what actually you discovered about your grandfather as the hero, but also uh, the perpetrator and also uh, the, the homeland. How have you been, uh, have they responded? Um, I, I had got, you know, I, I'll, get, I'll get to that very soon. But really when I started discovering all this on a very personal level, I had gone through the, the sta that stage of denial just personally. Right. So I understand uh, on, on a very personal level why the whole country has been going through denial because it's so painful to come to terms with the idea that you are respond that you come from a country that is responsible for committing the greatest right. crime in history. And so, um, so I literally was vibrating and shaking and I, I had gone through a depression too uh, because I lost my identity. I was this very exactly. proud Lithuanian princess, if you will. And, uh, you know, uh, you know, now I'm at the status of a pauper, uh, spiritually. So, um, it was a big, big, big letdown. And, and so once I sort of accepted what my grandfather did, as horrible as that is, I then had to like wrap my head around what the government is doing. Right. And hiding all that. So that was also uh, sort of a betrayal of what I thought was a wonderful uh, heritage, identity, heritage, uh, identity. So, right. and I and uh, I only realized all this after meeting Grant because I only knew of my family story before. So, so I was until 2018. I was sort of carrying the whole load myself. It felt like on my own shoulders. Um, now, and I knew enough not to talk about it with most Lithuanians. Like, like yeah. I have friends, you know, some girlfriends and whatever, and I talk, I would talk about it with them and I would be rather open about it. And I'd be like, whoa, whoa, Silver, are you sure you want to do this? No, I'm not sure, but I can't help it. It's like watching a train wreck. Like you just, you just have to do it. And, um, so I knew I was going to take it to the end, no matter what, but it wasn't until I met Grant you know, once we got past like the awkwardness of <laughs> all that, <laughs> we became <laughs> friends. <laughs> we yeah. became friends, and and then I, I I kept telling him, "Gosh, Grant, the wonderful thing is I don't feel like I'm at this alone anymore. Like that was to me the most beautiful thing that I'm not carrying it all. Like that was like two sets of shoulders. You know, like you can put like you know that old plow with the yoke, like like with two guys. You know, with the plow. Mm -hmm. behind. Like it's a lot easier." So I felt like it was like that. And um, and it just felt better already. It was already feeling better. Um, the Lithuanian community here has been very quiet. On, on Facebook, I've gotten a lot of flack. Mm -hmm. And then I'll take it for one, two, three messages. Block. <laughs> Block. Like, I don't deal with it anymore. Yeah. So, so, uh, you know, you want, you want to do all that, do it on your own Facebook page, not on my blog. <laughs> yeah. So I just, I just get pissed off and I, and I like, I give up. Um, so that's how I deal with it. But in general, you know, when, in 2018, after I met Grant, then I, you know, I knew I had to, I, you know, I was told I have to get an author platform. So this is where you have to kind of, I had to figure out a way to get the story public already so that I could get a literary agent who could find me a publisher. So that's when I wrote the story for salon.com. And that was the first time it went like really public. That's the first time it really came out. Like, like I came out of the closet with that story. Right. By the and way, Sylvia has a, a website that you can go to and get more information. Grant also has a website. They both have blogs on the times of Israel. So uh, there's it's definitely, uh, for, so there are a lot of questions and we're running out of time, but there are a lot of questions that I'm saying, read the book, but also you can go to their websites and also read their articles. They're very 
vocal, they're, you're a journalist. And uh, Grant as well is also an author. So they are writing a lot. Thank you so much, Grant, for putting that up. And you put down your name, but once you go in, you can just type in Sylvia's name and get um, her blog as well to, to okay. follow the journey. Maydeen, can, can I just add something to what Sylvia said about, yes. about the personal add impact? Something. You know, I, I'm, I won't be the victim. Uh, I'm not the victim of the Lithuanians. They, I won't accept lies and I won't accept being rebuffed. And when I realized quite what I was encountering, um, I knowingly set out to get them all on record. And I've got virtually every department in government on record, lying, falsifying information. Um, and this will be part of, of the lawsuit in front of, of, of the European Court of Human Rights. But the huge difficulty, the, 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 what I find incredibly emotionally unable to, to comprehend is why so many of our Jewish NGOs are collaborating with the Lithuanian government. So, you know, nobody's holding the Lithuanian government to account. Um, the, the Lithuanian diplomats come and stand in front of our Jewish NGOs and they dissemble. And they say, oh, in the future, we're going to do this. And yes, we're concerned about it, but there's never any specific response. There's been the Arad scandal. There's been the Malamut scandal. There's been when they tried to arrest the, the, um, the survivors. Um, there's been this Noreka scandal. And every time our NGOs are not asking for specific responses. You know, the government falsified Noreka rescue Jews. Our NGOs need to say, where's the Jew that he rescued? Right, where are they? But instead of standing back and saying, okay, we need to have relations, it's been, they, these are events from 80 years ago. Lithuania's been independent for 31 years already. They're not going to suddenly find ethics and truthfulness. We're not going to get to stop the Holocaust revisionism because we're nice to them. Right. So, it needs to be institutions such as Ghetto Fighters House, such as, such as all of our Jewish institutions that actually demand specific, accountable, measurable responses from the Lithuanian government. And they won't give those. And that's why I've had to litigate because we were never able to pin them down never able to get one iota of truth. Um, first of all, I do want to uh, mention that if you look at the chat box, there are, first of all, there are many people saying thank you for your courage. There are many uh, uh, family members of survivors from Lithuania. A few people have suggested maybe trying to do a documentary, maybe going on 60 Minutes. So we're talking In big process. time. For sure, in, <laughs> in the pro great. So you have to keep us in touch. And, and I also want to say, uh, yes, the Ghetto Fighters House definitely wants to be a platform for uh, for the truth and for justice. There's absolutely no other way to uh, say it. I do want to ask one more question before uh, we maybe take one or two questions from the audience. Um, and uh, for uh, it, the question is for both of you, Sylvia. The the book is out. It's written. What's the next step? And uh, the same question is for Grant, because uh, at this point, uh, just this past uh, Holocaust, International Holocaust Memorial Day, uh, we had someone from the Lithuanian parliament uh, say, and I quote, uh, there was no shortage of Holocaust perpetrators among the Jews themselves, especially in the ghetto self-government structures. Um, and this was in a speech that was given on Holocaust, in the International Holocaust Memorial Day in Lithuania. Uh, we need to name these people out loud and try not to have people like them again. Um, and so I, I'm wondering, do you think, uh, despite what uh, he said on, in January, do you both think that the book 
and the litigation will have an impact, first of all, within Lithuania, and secondly, an impact, like you said, as far as the Jewish community around the world, NGOs that are maybe uh, not uh, listening uh, to what the truth really is, um, what do you think the impact will be? It's only, it's only the beginning, right? I mean, the book came out now. Uh, <laughs> you have written about it before, and, but you've been working for many years as well, Grant. So how do you see the future? How do you see uh, this impact for the next generation, for your children, and uh, for the next generation of Lithuanians that are living in the States or living in Lithuania? How will this make an impact? Do you think it will make an impact? All I can say is I hope so. Yeah. Uh, nothing else has so far. Uh, this is the best hope of making an impact. I will say that when I was writing this book, I knew it was a fantastic story. And it took me, part of the reason it took me so long was I wanted to elevate it to the level of literature right. and not just a compilation of facts. And so I knew that, because literature is what changes hearts. And how do you... You know, and this is why I got an MFA in creative nonfiction, which is marrying, you know, nonfiction with literature and getting like the techniques and all that together. So this is what, you know, part of my journey that it cost me was just to uh, develop my own skill level right. and to be able to, to write the story so that it could be presented in such a way that people will just grasp the irony and the horror <laughs> of what is really going on. Um, so I, I do have hope that it will, I, you know, if this doesn't do it, I don't know what will. <laughs> so, so let me answer that, that, that for a moment. Um, they, again, they've been independent for 31 years and they've never come close to, to start telling the truth. So the government of Lithuania has a, an entire division called the genocide center that exists to rewrite Holocaust history. So They've just had a scandal in which it was exposed that they are writing fraudulent histories. 17 historians stepped forward and said that it's lies, it's propaganda, um, and basically gave me my entire case. So there is one historian uh, at the center that is, is specifically tasked with, with high level dishonesty. And when our Congress wrote a letter to the Lithuanian Prime Minister saying, um, you're using this for Holocaust revisionism, you're misstating the facts, falsifying, the response from the Lithuanian government was, your members of Congress are just politicians. We know more about Congress than, than, than they do. So a few days ago, the government fired the whistleblower. Right. They didn't fire. They didn't fire the uh, rewriter of history that's insulting the very members of Congress that are sending the U.S. military to defend them. It signifies that Lithuania is more married to Holocaust revisionism than they are to the very existence of their own country. So to think that they are going to willingly step forward and tell the truth unless we make it difficult. Nice. So no, I don't think that our work is going to have an impact, but I'll tell you what will, Medine. The insults by the Lithuanian government towards our members of Congress and the how blatant they have been in their Holocaust revisionism there is a resolution in front of US Congress right now to condemn Lithuania. And there is a separate resolution in front of the US Senate to condemn Lithuania. And there are a couple of resolutions in front of state houses to condemn Lithuania. Now, there is another entity that's actually doing a fundraiser, if I may, to send both Ephraim Zurov's book and Sylvia's book to every member of Congress. Right. So we're talking about Ephraim's book, Our People, with Luta? Correct. Right. Okay. We talked about that in the first program. 
as well as okay. um, so yes so this link that i've just sent is to send a copy of sylvia's book to every member of congress because until lithuania until it's more expensive for lithuania to uh to stop lying there's, there's, they're not going to do it willingly. So we've got to we, we, we've got to identify them and show what they're doing. And we've got to make it cost them something. So they can either choose their lies and, and the rest of the world has clarity on what the Lithuanian government is. Or they can tell the truth and have relations. But it is going to take our Jewish NGOs to put the to put the foot down and to say we're not going to tolerate this anymore and and it will be coming from the u.s government first because we, we have that in process first of all um thank you for putting up the link and again it's a it's a very important uh statement that you know both of you as americans uh are using your american citizenship to if you say, let's shed a light from here uh, within Lithuania and, and send out a message. And I think maybe the timing is pretty, is, is uh, gonna serve you well uh, at this point. I won't go any further. I do wanna state though, um, because I don't, I don't know if we have time for questions, but there is in our audience today, uh, Dr. Uh, Ifrat Kedem, and she is in Vilna now uh, from uh, the Ministry of Education in Israel. And she is working with the uh, Jewish school in Vilna Orta. Uh, I don't remember the name, I'm sorry. Ah, Shalom Aleichem. And uh, she uh, wrote that uh, she uh, says, really, Kolakavod, we say in Hebrew, uh, great work uh, to see what you're doing and being assertive about it and uh, trying to make a change. Um, nechishut is another word that I don't remember in English right now. It's not really being assertive. It's, you know, hanging in there and being adamant to get uh, this uh, out. Um, I think I will try to see, just scoping through, maybe, you know, Grant probably was looking as well, is there's a question. Uh, what, what I will do, by the way, because of all of the comments that are in the chat box today, I will send that out to Sylvia and Grant, so don't Please. worry. Please. Um, a lot of words of encouragement, of course, there are also families that um, are writing about their family histories. I also got emails while we were talking. Um, <clears throat> actually, someone asked uh, twice if you know about Rita Gabis. Yes. You've heard about Rita Gabis, both of you, right? Yes. So uh, yes. Lydia Friedman was writing that uh, she was also the granddaughter of a Lithuanian. Nazi collaborator, and she also wrote a book about it. So here we see that there is some momentum here. Um, but but let, let me contradict that, Medine, okay. because there, there has been momentum for 30 years and a scandal breaks out <laughs> and then the Lithuanian diplomats come and say, oh, we'll take, we'll take care of it, we'll take care of it. They offer, they offer us Jews platitudes mm -hmm. and empty promises and then we move on to the next one without ever having resolved the last one. The difference between my lawsuits is that I haven't relented. I haven't, they, they have been depending on me to get tired or right. to get intimidated. And I've refused to do either one, which is why it's now a problem. The combination between Sylvia's book and, and the lawsuits is that they now have to deal with us. And they are actually, they, they, they won't get on a program with us. They won't discuss us. They won't refer to us in public. It is as if we are in two completely separate universes okay. and they pretend it isn't happening. But Sylvia is not going away and I'm not going away and hopefully Ghetto Fighters House will stay the course. Of course. And for the 220,000 Jewish murder victims in Lithuania, the smallest thing that we can do for them is give them the truth. 
And if it takes me the rest of my life, Medine, I will be there until we can give those victims, our families, the truth. The truth. And with that, I want to thank uh, both Sylvia and Grant once again to say congratulations on uh, the book launch. And I want to invite everyone to look for the book, to read it again and again. Like, I'm, well, mine is somewhere in, in <laughs> on its way for the past six months. I'm still waiting. But um, I, I, I do want to say uh, thank you first of all, for coming to, to be here today um, and to, I, I don't want to use the word celebrate, to celebrate your, your journeys and to praise them. And there's a lot of praise in our chat box. Um, and to hopefully to feel that you have our support. Hold the book closer to strong. the camera. Yes, yes there, now you can hold it up. Um, and, and know that we definitely uh, support uh, what you're doing. Please, everyone, look at the links that uh, Grant put up and uh, go to their uh, websites and go to their blogs on the Times of Israel and, and read. Because some people were asking, can you tell us more about Jonas uh, Noriega? So I say, read the book. <laughs> and you will get an intriguing journey, personal journey, uh, of Sylvia uh, and her discoveries and the turning points and the roller coaster and the ups and the downs and the secrets that come out. It's just a fascinating uh, journey. And all the while we're talking about the Holocaust uh, and the discovering slowly and gently along with her uh, just how uh, horrible and uh, dramatic it was. And for Grant, again, for your motivation, um, I thought you would mention that you do have um, some friends at ICANN that, <laughs> that are helping you uh, and supporting you as well. Yes. It's important to mention that you, uh, you can't do it on your own. You need no. to have uh, that support with you as well. So, so th there, is, there is one NGO, uh, IsraelUSA.org, um, that has really stepped forward um, in, 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 in just the bravest way to, to adopt this. Um, when that NGO saw the, here, the leader of that actually worked for the Israeli uh, consulate here in LA for many, many years. And for all those years, he'd been hearing me talk about this over and over and over again. And then he got into the meat and potatoes of it and saw the insult against Holocaust victims, the, the murder of their memory again. Um, it's a man by the name of Dylan Hozier who's just done the most unbelievable work and I wanna publicly thank him. Um, he, he's just, he, he's really done more in the short period that he's been focusing on this than, than I've been able to do in many years. Wonderful, that, so I'm glad that we were able to uh, mention that as well. Thank you. Okay, I want to say thank you to our audience and for your questions and for your comments uh, today. I think that this uh, two-part series on Lithuania is really just the tip of the iceberg. And I think we were talking a little bit about maybe how we can go forward and maybe uh, do further programs, future programs as well. Um, and I want to remind everyone that our programs are recorded. So please pass them on to your friends as well. And of course, read the book. And, uh, read the book. Read the, and book. read the book. And read the book. And read the book. Right. Actually, someone asked you to put it closer to the camera. Um, right. So you actually see a Sylvia holding a picture of her grandfather. This is the picture that was on the wall in your home as part this of a was, shrine. This was the picture. This was the picture that Chicago Tribune used on the front page. So it's been on the front page of the New York Times and the Chicago Tribune. It, it's, it's been the press worldwide. There is absolutely no deniability for the Lithuanian government anywhere on anything. Please okay. read the book. Please read the book. Okay, everyone. Uh, I want to say good morning, good afternoon, and good night to everyone. And hopefully we'll see you again next week, uh, oh, March 21st, for our uh, next program with Rachel Cerati. So goodbye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sylvia. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Fran.
Okay. We'll be in touch. Bye.